I just finished a paper where we were looking at something called the hard steps model, which is this model that's been out there for a long time that purports to say intelligent life in the universe will be really rare. And it made all these assumptions about the Earth's history, particularly at the history of life and the history of the planet or have nothing to do with each other. And it turns out, as I was doing the reading for this, that uh, Earth probably early on had a, had a more mild form of plate tectonics. And then somewhere about a billion years ago, it ramped up. And that ramping up changed everything on the planet. Because here's a funny thing. The Earth used to be flat. <laughs> what I mean by that, right? So all the flat earthers out there can get excited for one second. Clip it. <laughs> what, I meant by, <laughs> what I mean by that is that there really weren't many mountain ranges, right? The beginning of, I think the term is orogenesis, mountain building, the true Himalayan style giant mountains didn't happen until this more robust form of plate tectonics where the plates are really being driven around the planet. And that is when you get the crusts hitting each other and they start pushing you know, into these Himalayan style mountains, the weathering of that, the erosion of that puts huge amounts of nutrients, you know, things that microbes want to use, uh, into the oceans. And then the, what we call the net primary productivity, the, you know, the photo, the, the, the bottom of the food chain, how much sugars they're producing, how much photosynthesis they're doing shot up by a factor of a, almost a thousand, right? So the the fact that you had plate tectonics supercharged evolution in some sense, you know, like we're not exactly sure how, how, how it happened, but it's clear that the amount of life, the amount of living activity that was happening really got a boost from the fact that suddenly there was plate te- this new vigorous form of plate tectonics. So it's nice to have turmoil in terms of temperature, in terms of uh, surface geometries, in terms of the chemistry of the planet, turmoil. Yeah, that's actually really true because what happens is if you look at the history of life, that's a really, you know, it's an excellent point you're bringing up. If you look at the history of life on Earth, we get, uh, you know, abiogenesis somewhere around at least 3.8 billion years ago. And that's the first microbes. They kind of take over enough that they really do, you get a biosphere, you get a biosphere that is actively changing the planet. But then you go through this period they call the boring billion, where like it's a billion years and it's just microbes. Nothing's happening. It's just microbes. I mean, they're, they're do- the microbes are doing amazing things. They're inventing uh, um, fermentation. Thank you very much. For, <laughs> we appreciate that. Um, but it's not until sort of you get probably this, these continents slamming into each other. You really get the beginning of continents forming and driving changes that evolution has to respond to that on a planetary scale. This turmoil, this chaos is creating new niches as well as closing other ones. And biology, evolution has to respond to that. And somewhere around there is when you get the Cambrian explosion is when suddenly every body plan, um, you know, evolution goes on an orgy essentially. Uh, So yeah, it does look like the, that chaos or that turmoil was actually very helpful to evolution. I wonder if there is some, uh, extremely elevated levels of chaos, almost like catastrophes behind every leap of evolution. Like you're not gonna have leaps. Um, like in, in in human societies, we have like an Einstein that comes up with a good idea, but it feels like on an evolutionary time scale, you need some real big drama going on for <laughs> for the evolutionary system to have to come up to a solution to that drama like an extra complex solution to that drama. Well, I think what's, I'm not sure if that's true. I don't know if it needs to be like an, an almost extinction event, right? Because right. it's certainly true that we have gone through almost extinction events, right? We've had, you know, uh, five ma- mass extinctions, but you don't necessarily see that like there was this giant evolutionary leap happening right. after those. So, you know, with the uh, comet impact, um, the KT boundary, Certainly, you know, lots of niches opened up and that's why we're here, right? Because, you know, our ancestors were just little, basically rodents, rats living under the footsteps of the dinosaurs. And it was that common impact that opened the, uh, the route for us, but it wasn't, I mean, that still took another, you know, 65 million years. It wasn't like this thing immediately happened, but what we found with this hard steps paper, because the whole idea of the hard steps paper was. It was one of these uh, anthropic reasoning kinds of things where Brandon Carter said, oh, look, the intelligence doesn't show up on Earth Mm -hmm. until about, um, you know, almost close to when the end of the sun's lifetime. Uh, And so he's like, well, there should be no reason why 
the sun's lifetime and the time for evolution to produce intelligence should be the same. Uh, and so therefore, and he goes through all this reasoning, anthropic reasoning, and, and, and he ends up with the idea that like, oh, it must be that the odds of getting intelligence are super low. And so that's the hard steps, right? So there was a series of steps in evolution that were, you know, very, very hard. And because of that, you can calculate some probability distributions. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody loves a good probability distribution, and they went a long way with this. But it turns out that the whole thing is flawed because – on one, you know, when you look at it, of course, the time scale for the sun's evolution and the time scale for evolution on life are coupled because life and the, the, the time scale for evolution of the earth is coupled is about the same time scale as the evolution is the sun. It's billions of years. The earth evolves over billions of years and life and the earth co-evolve. That's what Brandon Carter didn't see is that actually the fate of the earth and the fate of life are inextricably combined. Uh, and this is really important for astrobiology too. Um, life doesn't happen on, uh, on a planet. It happens to a planet. So this is something that David Grinspoon and Sarah Walker both say. And, you know, uh, uh, I agree with this. It's a really nice way of putting it. Um, so, uh, you know, play tectonics, um, the evolution of oxygen, of an oxygen atmosphere, which only happened because of life. Um, these things, you know, these are, are things that are happening where life and the planet are sort of sloshing back and forth. Mm -hmm. And so rather than to your, your point about, do you need giant catastrophes? Maybe not giant catastrophes, but what happens is as the earth and life are evolving together, windows are opening up evolutionary windows. Like for example, life put oxygen into the atmosphere. When, when life invented this new form of photosynthesis about two and a half billion years ago, that broke water apart to, you know, work to do its, its shenan chemical shenanigans. Um, it broke water apart and pushed oxygen into the atmosphere. That's why there's oxygen in the atmosphere. It's only because of life. Um, that opened up huge possibilities, new spaces for evolution to happen. But it also changed the chemistry of the planet forever. So the evolu the introduction of, of, a, of oxygen photosynthesis changed the planet forever. And it opened up a bunch of windows for evolution that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Like, for example, you and I, we need that amount of oxygen. Big-brained creatures need an oxygen-rich atmosphere because oxygen is so potent uh, um, for metabolism. So you couldn't get intelligent creatures 100 million years after the planet formed. So really, on a scale of a planet, when there's uh, billions, trillions of organisms on a planet, they can actually have planetary scale impact. Yeah. So, so the chemical shenanigans of an individual organism when scaled out to trillions can actually change a planet. Yeah, I, and we know this for a fact now. Like this is, so there was this thing, Gaia theory, that, mm -hmm. you know, with James Lovelock uh, introduced in the 70s, um, and then Lynn Margellis, the biologist Lynn Margellis together. So this Gaia theory was the idea that planets pretty much take, or sorry, life takes over a planet. Life mm -hmm. hijacks a planet in a way that um, the sum total of life creates these feedbacks between the planet and the life such that it keeps the planet habitable. It's kind of a homeostasis, right? I can go out like right now outside, it's 100 degrees, right? And I go outside, but my internal temperature is going to be the same. And I can go back to, you know, Rochester, New York in the winter, and it's going to be, you know, zero degrees, but my internal temperature is going to be the same. That's homeostasis. The idea of Gaia theory was that life, uh, the biosphere, exerts this pressure on the planet or these feedbacks on the planet that even as other things are changing, the planet will always stay in the right kinds of conditions for life. Now, when this theory came out, it was very controversial. People were like, oh my God, you know, what are you smoking weed? You know, and like, and there were all these guy in festivals with guy in uh, dances. And so, you know, it became very popular in the new age community. But Lovelock, actually, they were able to show that, no, this has nothing to do with, like, the planet being conscious or anything. It was about these feedbacks that, that by the biology, the biosphere can exert these feedbacks. And now that's become, whether or not, it's still, we're still unclear whether there are true Gaian feedbacks in the sense that the planet can really exert complete control. But it is absolutely true that um, the biosphere is a major player in Earth's history. So the biosphere fights for homeostasis on Earth. The bio, so, okay, what I would say right now is, I don't know if I can say that scientifically. I can certainly say that the biosphere does a huge amount of the regulation of the planetary state. Mm -hmm. And over billions of years has strongly modified 
the evolution of the planet. So whether or not a guy, a true guy in feedback would be exactly what mm -hmm. you said, right? The guy, the biosphere is this somehow, and Sarah Walker and David Grinspoon and I actually did a paper on this about the idea of planetary intelligence or cognition across a planetary scale. And I think that actually is possible. It's not conscious, but there is a kind of cognitive activity going on. The biosphere in some sense knows what is happening because of these feedbacks. Um, so, but so it's still unclear whether we have these full guy in feedbacks, but it, we certainly have semi guy in feedbacks. If there's a perturbation on the planetary scale, temperature, you know, insulation, how much sunlight's coming in, the biosphere will start to have feedbacks that will damp that perturbation. Temperature goes up, the biosphere starts doing something, temperature comes down. Now, I wonder if the technosphere also has a Gaian feedback or elements of a Gaian feedback, such that the technosphere will also fight to some degree for homeostasis. Open question, I guess. Well, that's, I'm glad you asked that question because that, that, that paper that David and uh, uh, Sarah and I wrote, what we were arguing was, is that over the history of a planet, right? When life first forms, you know, 3.8 billion years ago, it's kind of thin on the ground, right? You've got the first species, you know, um, these are all microbes and they have not yet, uh, been, they're not going to enough of them to exert any kind of these Gaian feedback. So we call that an immature biosphere. Mm -hmm. But then as time goes on, as life becomes more robust and it begins to exert these feedbacks, keeping the planet in the place where it needs to be for life, we call that a mature biosphere, right? And the important thing, and we're going to, I'm sure later on, we're going to talk about definitions of life and such. There's this great term called autopoiesis uh, that Francisco uh, Varela, the neurobiologist Francisco Varela came up with. And he said, you know, one of the defining things about life is this property of autopoiesis, which means self-creating and self-maintaining. Life does not create the conditions which will destroy itself, right? It's always trying to keep itself in a place where it can stay alive. So the biosphere, from this guy in perspective, has been autopoietic for the, you know billions of years. Now we just invented this technosphere in the last you know couple of hundred years, and what we were arguing in that paper is that it's an immature technosphere, right? Because right now with climate change and all the other things we're doing, we you know we're destroying the technosphere right now is sort of destroying the conditions under which it needs to maintain itself. So the real job for us, if we're going to last over you know, geologic timescales. If we want a technosphere that's going to last tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years, then we've got to become mature, which means to not uh, undermine the conditions, to not subvert the conditions that you need to stay alive. So as of right now, I'd say we're not autopoietic. Well, I wonder if we look across thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, that perturbations... The technosphere should create perturbations as a way for developing greater and greater defenses against perturbations, which sounds like a ridiculous statement, but basically uh, go out and play in the yard and hurt yourself to, to strengthen <laughs> the, or like drink water from the, from the pond. From the pond, yeah, right. To Get strengthen, sick a few times. To strengthen the immune system. Yeah. Well, you know, what's interesting with the technosphere, we could talk about this more, but like, you know, the we're just emerging as a technosphere in terms of as a interplanetary technosphere, right? That's really the next step for us is to, um, David Grinspoon talks about, I love this idea of anti-accretion, like this amazing thing that for the first time, you know, over the entire history of the planet, stuff is coming off the planet, right? It used to be everything just fell down, all the meteorites fell down, but now we're starting to push stuff out. Um, and, you know, like the idea of planetary defense or such, you know, we are actually going to start exerting perturbations on the solar system as a whole. We're, we're going to start engineering if we make it, right? I always like to say that if we can get through climate change, the prize at the end is the solar system, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so we will um, we'll be changed, literally engineering the solar system. But what you can think of right now with what's happening with the Anthropocene, the great acceleration that, that uh, the is the technosphere, you know, is the creation of the, that is a giant perturbation on the biosphere, right? And what you can't do is, you know, the technosphere sits on top of the biosphere and the tech, if the technosphere undermines the biosphere for its own conditions of habitability, then you're in trouble, right? I mean, the biosphere is not going away. There's nothing we could do. Like the idea that we have to save the earth is a little ridiculous. Like the earth is not a furry little bunny that we need to protect, mm -hmm. but it's the conditions for us, right? We, 
Humanity emerged out of this, out of the Holocene, the last 10,000 years interglacial period. We can't tolerate very different kinds of Earths. Um, so that's what I mean about a perturbation.